Right, my name is Craig Morlam. I own Ionic Systems Limited. Um, and I've been in window cleaning ever since I left the RAF, young man, 24 years old. Um, looking forward to my retirement now. I turn 62 next year. So it, it, what started off as a job to support my family after leaving my Air Force career turned out to be you know, my full-time career when really I thought that window cleaning was just something to make ends meet for a short time until something better came along and nothing better ever did come along. Yeah, I, I, my first customer was my next door neighbour, charged £2.50 back then. Um, and this was 1985 or 86, something like that. I built a house round quite quickly. I did a lot of door knocking and ended up with 2,000 customers within 18 months or so. And so there was a need to employ people. Eventually, I ended up doing more commercial work and um, found my forte in abseiling. Little did I know that my childhood experience growing up in North Wales, where my family were mountaineers and we were part of the Pemma Mountaineering Club. Um, so we were rock climbing and abseiling. Um, little did I know that that would have a bearing later on in my life. And so I was abseiling on buildings cleaning windows as early as 1987. And very few window cleaners were doing that at that time. Very, very few. But the, the, the work we were doing with the abseiling was, was quite wide and varied. Of course, it all started with window cleaning on fairly small jobs in the Swindon area. And before you, we knew it, we were working right along the M4 corridor um, up into Scotland, Midlands, doing some pretty big buildings, the um, centre park sites, not only doing the outside of the domes, but also underneath them using aid climbing techniques and putting steel tension cables in and, and, and climbing around underneath those. And the pinnacle came when we were doing um, nuclear power stations. Started off with pressure washing the outsides of them and cleaning the windows, and before we knew it, we were doing high-level cleaning in the... Uh, turbine halls and eventually in, in the reactor halls themselves. Uh, on one occasion we had to do a job which meant we were underneath the sump of uh, size well B um, nuclear power station with a reactor right above our heads. I fell from a ladder one time, was lucky not to be injured. Uh, fell from a roof one time and, and almost died, almost lost my life. Uh, I was only 29 then. You know, My, my son was just a, a little boy and he could have lost me. So that, that had a bearing on, on the way I looked at things from that point on. Then um, I've never been risk averse, but I do like to manage risk. How did you go on to the water-fed water pole side of it? Yeah, who would think it? Um, so you imagine my 30-year-old self. Then uh, I was young, fit, athletic. The, the guys on my team were the same sort of animal. Um, if they weren't rock climbing and, and parachuting and base jumping in their free time, they were doing some other crazy thing. And um, we were skilled window cleaners, like really skilled, in my opinion. This manly group of people, I persuaded them to use water-fed poles from the ground, and we were kind of forced to do it because of changes in health and safety rules. It was quite an irony. We would be abseiling on a tall building, let's say Guy's Hospital in London, and all the health and safety people would leave us alone. Of course, we'd, we'd furnish them with risk assessments and method statements. And because they knew little or nothing about rope access, they regarded us as the experts and they left us alone. But if the same abseiling window cleaner climbed a 30-foot ladder, they were on us like a rash. Oh, you need two people, one to foot the ladder, one to climb the ladder. They wanted hard hats, high vis, steel toe caps, warning signs, cordons, and airbags and parachutes were surely on the horizon. And that was all because of a change in health and safety rules. It was the uh, health, safety, and welfare regulations that came into effect. I first come across the Tucker Pole in um, 1993. I went to the International Window Cleaning Association convention in New Orleans. And I went there to learn about how window cleaners dealt with the big high-rise buildings in America because you know, I was a rope access guy and I wanted to see how they did it because everything's bigger and better there, isn't it? Um, and so that was my focus. But I did come across the, the Tucker pole while I was there. I was pulling his leg. How can it possibly work? You know, the, the, the water's going to leave watermarks and spotting on the glass when it dries. And, and, and my customers wouldn't be too happy with that. And his response was that I shouldn't regard it as an all-day, everyday window cleaning tool. A tucker pole was something that you could use to clean a window where some clean was better than no clean at all. 
Um, and he said that, he pointed out that in large areas of the United States, the water out of the tap is soft. And in those areas, you get far less spotting and far more pleasing results. We needed to turn our tap water into um, soft water. And so the journey began with a simple household water softener. Turned out to be inadequate for uh, all the reasons that I know now. And we added more filters, different filters, researched the whole water treatment industry. I even went to California and spent some time with a, a water treatment company over there. Learned all about reverse osmosis. Eventually, we ended up with a five-stage water treatment system on a trailer, and we used it to very good effect. And by 1997, it was working very, very well, and we were growing our window cleaning business around the Swindon area. We were winning contracts just on the basis of how safe it was to clean windows. So it was decision time. Do we keep it to ourselves and just grow the biggest window cleaning company I could, or do I share this magic way of cleaning windows with other people so that they also could benefit from the safety of cleaning windows from the ground? Well, obviously it was the, the second choice that I made. I spoke with the people again in, in America. We became the Tucker Pole distributor in the UK. And uh, Mr. Tommy Tucker, who uh, I have fond memories of, he... Um, he came along to the show we launched it at the NEC in 1997. He didn't believe for a minute that I could get it off the ground. Never believed that window cleaners were willing to invest in a water treatment system to go alongside his pole. And we had the market to ourselves for a couple of years and it was only when we got some traction that one or two competitors came along. One of the competitors came along because we chose to drop the Tucker pole. Quite a thing, to build a business on the back of something and then walk away from it. And uh, there was only one reason for that, and it was because we'd learned about some electrocutions that had happened in the United States. I was told in an offhand conversation about one that happened fairly recently at that time. Um, and I was quite shocked. And I asked, I, I delved deeper into the subject, and there'd been quite a few American window cleaners who had lost their lives. And at that time, in the UK, there was quite a, an anti-water fed pole sentiment. Some of the die-hard window cleaners, including certain organisation, wasn't that keen on water fed poles. They were all defending the use of ladders. Really, they weren't quite as dangerous as we were pointing them out to be. And had we suffered an electrocution at that point, early on, I think that would have been game over. And uh, I was too invested at that point. When we heard about these electrocutions in the United States, I felt I had to do something about it. And I came across a company who could make some composite tubes for, for us. Carbon fibre, which would be stiffer than the aluminium, a bit lighter also, um, but also a glass fibre handle section that we could apply to the base that would serve to protect against the risk of electrocution. I thought we'd solved the problem. The risk of electrocution was removed, I felt at least in the UK. And then as time went by, there were more and more competitors that came on the scene. Um, those early competitors are now long, no longer in business, but there were competitors who, one of them adopted the aluminium tucker pole that we'd moved away from for safety reasons. And there were others who were producing carbon fibre poles with no glass fibre handle section on them, what have you. So I kind of knew that the day would come when we would see a fatality in the UK from electrocution. Many years passed before that happened. There'd been talk about electrical strikes, poles that had been hit, images that turned up on the internet of damaged poles, but um, I wasn't aware of any fatalities. That was until 2001, when in the same year, two window cleaners lost their lives using uh, water-fed poles when they'd had a strike from overhead power lines. Um, and then we were approached early this year, 2024, by the Federation of Window Cleaners. Brian Dolby had a chat with us at one of the trade shows we were attending. Um, he wanted to, to try and progress this. He was aware of the risk of electrocution and he wanted to do something about it. And so the wheels were set in motion for the industry to get together. Waterford Pole suppliers, the health and safety executive, um, people responsible for the power infrastructure all getting together to discuss this issue. Um, and, and fairly soon after the, those meetings were initiated, we heard news about Jason's accident. This is Jason Knight. That Jason Knight, that's right. When you hear about news like that happening, 
it, it, it's, it's upsetting. It was upsetting we, when we heard about the accidents in 2001. Um, they were both family men, their children. <laughs> and, um, and what did we do about that? Well, there was no more we could do. Our poll already met the British standard. It already had the, uh, the warning labels on there, warning people not to get, in not to get too close to uh, overhead power lines. In the British Window Cleaning Academy training that we'd been also undertaking since 1997, we emphasised the risk of electrocution on every single course. Yeah, the, uh, the, the accident that occurred in, um, in California, um, that was one of our polls. And um, the, it, the, the situation was that um, there were some really big pylons which were previously sited on open ground and a decision had been made that buildings could be erected adjacent to these power lines and um, the stipulation was that the windows could only be cleaned using access equipment mounted on the building and uh, that, that I'm led to believe that equipment had fell, fallen into disrepair and the building owners didn't want to pay to, to reinstate it and so water-fed poles were authorised for use there. At some point, some landscaping had been carried out and there was a planted area and the path which ran adjacent to the building ran around it. And the window cleaner had been working adjacent to these power lines and what he ought to have done was lower the pole and walk it round the, the, the planted area and re-erect it, but he chose to lift it vertically and walk it around the planted area. Well, he got within striking distance of what was a 130,000 volt power line. And um, he survived that accident. Uh, he survived the accident because our pole had the insulated glass fibre handle section. Our pole had its warning label on it, it had its glass fibre handle section on it, and uh, as I said, the gentleman survived. That must have made you feel quite happy, had it, that he was using one of your poles and he'd <laughs> well, survived? not happy at all. Um, you know, we, th we thought we had a product that was, was going to be safe to use. And, uh, and although he didn't lose his life, you know, it was a, a moment for scrutiny. And, and that was the point when we, we researched the British standard, realised it existed, and, uh, and ultimately adopted it. If somebody was to buy a British standard pole, how would they know it was a British standard pole? Well, first of all, it has to, um, it has to have the British standard logo embossed on the pole. It will say BS 8020. It will also say the working voltage of 1,000 volts and the year of production of the pole. Um, the, the pole still has the customary warning label on there, warning people not to use the pole near overhead power lines. British Standard calls for the inner section of the tube to be white in colour and the outer section to be safety orange. And the reason for that is that wear and tear on the, on the pole just from years of use would wear the orange section away and when you can see the white underneath and grinning through that would be the time to replace the, the, the handle. That's the point at which the insulation would be deemed to be inadequate. When you get a batch of poles come from your supplier, mm -hmm. how do you know that those uh, are up to standard, up to British standard, it, you know, they could be saying that they are, but how would you actually know? The British standard ultimately calls for the handle section to be tested to 10,000 volts and then certified for use at 1,000 volts, giving a 10 to 1 safety factor. That's, that's the beauty of the British standard, it calls for you to carry out your own independent testing to satisfy yourself that you meet the, the required standards. So we've got a test facility and we uh, test a number of poles from each batch, put it on there, apply 10,000 volts and, and take a reading and if it passes then it's good to be installed on a, on a pole and sold and if it doesn't, which has never happened, touch wood, so then, if then you wouldn't sell it. Going on from, obviously you've brought up about Jason, is there anything that you're considering bringing into effect since Jason's accident? Well, isn't it interesting that um, this has been an evolving story, right, from the original Tucker pole made entirely from alum aluminium and the realisation that that had, uh, that had caused fatalities in the United States. A journey which then led us to produce a composite pole with a glass fibre handle um, didn't meet any particular standard because there was no standard at that point. 
uh, and then realising that that measure wasn't sufficient, and then adopting the British standard and thinking that's it, we've got it covered now. And then you hear about Jason's accident, and it was interesting because it that that pole also had a glass fibre handle on it, not tested to any particular standard, but it did have what you could call an insulating glass fibre handle. And my understanding is that the accident occurred when Jason lifted the pole in order to lower it and reached up and grabbed a hold of the carbon fibre section above it, thus completing the circuit and resulting in his, his electrocution. And If Jason had been using one of your insulated poles, do you think that would have stopped him from having a problem? No, it wouldn't, because... It was only the ha it's only the handle section that meets the British standard. And as soon as he reached up and took hold of the second section, which is carbon fibre, or would have possibly been carbon fibre, then the same accident would have occurred. And we have been aware for some time that having two sections at the base would, would, would overcome this problem. Um, and, and, and there's a number of reasons for considering why you would do so, and also considerations that you have to take into account of why you don't do it at that time um, and one of them is price and weight if you have two glass fiber handle sections the one that's actually the handle and then the, the, the section above you're increasing the weight of the product the pole becomes heavier and um, the whole industry has become quite geared to, to promoting the lightest weight pole so to offer a pole which is ultimately safer because it has two insulating glass fiber sections at the base wouldn't be adopted at the extent that you'd like and you'd lose sales potentially because you've created a product which is heavier than the competitors so unless you can have an industry-wide changeover where one competitor doesn't have a weight advantage over another then it would be very difficult to achieve and that's why we we hadn't done it before um, the fact now that there's some momentum behind the whole issue and that the Federation initiated this meeting in order to um, discuss the whole issue of electrocution and that happened prior to Jason's accident um, means that with the input and the good grace of all suppliers a common standard could be achieved and then no individual company is suffering a weight disadvantage but the customer is benefiting from having the risk taken out of their hands, so to speak. Mm, so you're saying that having that second section insulated would be your first line of defence? Oh, absolutely. So will you in future be doing the first two sections? We, we are going to, whether the rest of the industry adopt it or not. Personally, I couldn't sleep at night knowing that there's a safer solution and then not adopting it.